made a motion to appoint acting mayor Ken Leon. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion to Mayor Ken Leon. The gavel is yours. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the January 5th regular meeting of the Lake Forest City Council. Would uh, the clerk please call the roll? Certainly. Alderman Walden? Here. Alderman Beidler? Here. Alderman Morrison? Or Alderman Leon? Here. Alderman Katz? Here. Alderman Meisenberg is absent. Alderman Newman? Here. Alderman Moreno? Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Biddy. Uh, now, would you please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? First thing on our agenda tonight is uh, comments by a mayor. That would be, I guess, acting mayor. Could be me. Um, really, only one note. Uh, we just uh, just came from a little tour of uh, the progress at the Gorton Center, and uh, it is continues to be a source of amazement to me from where Gorton was in 2010 to where it is today. But the construction is moving along very rapidly. And uh, it, it's it's quite impressive, uh, and I think uh, I think people are going to be stunned at how dramatic the change to Gordon is. Uh, you know, with the results of um, all the hard work of the, the board there, the uh, executive director Brenda Dick, and uh, and, the, and their capital campaign. Uh, you know, they once once upon a time had their credit line shut down by the bank and that was the only uh, that was the only capital or income or cash they had um, that was 2010 now they're they've raised over six million dollars in their current capital campaign and uh, the construction is, is going to make a dramatic difference in the facility and I think for the whole community so uh, quite a rebirth and uh, great leadership uh, the city's been involved on in that as well and uh, Couldn't be more Im impressed and enthused. So, stay tuned. They say they have a wedding planned for Feb for the end of February. So, mm -hmm. um. George, could I could I just add sure. something? Um, we were we were we were not hit hard in any kind of a pitch from uh, from Executive Director uh, Brenda Dick because she was really incredibly appreciative of all the city support. But she also, I think, feels really strongly, as does the board, with ab about as much community involvement as, as possible. So I think even though they've done incredibly well in their fundraising, my guess is there are still fundraising opportunities uh, for those of us who have not participated yet. Uh, so I'm sure it would be possible to find out about those uh, online uh, or, or somehow, probably just calling Gorton and asking. But, but I would encourage community members to take part in what's going to be a truly Brenda did mention to me quietly that they were still around seven hundred thousand dollars short of their goal. So um, there's more help uh, that would be appreciated from the entire community, large or small. Uh, donations, I'm sure, would be very well received. So uh, the uh, next item on our agenda is uh, 2014-15 new board and commission appointments and reappointments. We have uh, an appointment of Carrie Travers to uh, the library board and an appointment of Steve Goldman to the Gorton board uh, to represent the city. Um, I would uh, ask for a motion here to, <coughs> to approve the appointments. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. And then the next item is uh, comments by the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor and members of the council. We'll take a pause now for a commercial announcement. And I'm going to ask Elizabeth Holub to come up to the podium and demonstrate a new online service that's available for online water billing. Elizabeth?
Thank you, Bob, and uh, good evening, Acting Mayor and City Council members. We're very excited to announce that uh, this morning we have launched the online water billing um, act service uh, on the city's website. And I just wanted to take you through a few brief slides to just introduce it to you and talk a little bit about how we're communicating it to the residents. Um, we have uh, two features available now. First, online water bill payments. Residents will have the option to either choose one-time or recurring payments, either by credit card or electronic check uh, via the application, as well as the option to select electronic notification. And residents would be able to elect electronic only notification of their water bill or receive electronic notification as well as continue to receive their paper bill in the mail. Um, this, some of this is difficult to read, um, but I wanted, this is the city's uh, homepage, and there's really three different ways that a resident can get to this application. First, they can go over to the I want to drop down menu, select pay register for, and then water bill, and that will launch them to the appropriate pages. Another option is in the top right hand of the home page. Just go to the click link, quick links drop down menu and you'll have options for both water billing and water billing online payments. The water billing online payment will launch, launch you directly to the payment site. And water billing will take you to the main page for water billing of the city's website. And the third option is to go to services from the home page go down to water billing. Once a resident gets to the water billing page um, on the city's website, um, there is some brief introductory uh, information related to the new application. They can click here to access the online water billing application. Uh, and also, I just wanted to point out that over here on documents, we have two FAQs. We have the existing FAQ on gener general water billing questions, but we've now added a frequently asked question document specific to online water billing. And our plan is to update that frequently as we first roll this out to see what kind of questions we receive from residents and just keep that. It's a PDF document that we can easily update uh, and load to the website as needed to keep that current and updated. Um, we have made um, great efforts to um, ensure the continuity within this application. You have now, once you've reached the screen, you've launched to an external application outside the city's website, but you can see that it has the look and feel of the city's website to try to make that transition for the user uh, seamless. So you would come to this utility billing logon page. If you have already created an account here, you would enter your account number and password. If you're visiting this application for the first time and need to create your online account initially, you can either click here or create account on the left navigation bar. Uh, you'll need your account number, your utility billing account number and the due date of your most recent water bill in order to create an account for your household. I would note that without any PR whatsoever, we had our first payment today, so someone out there <laughs> is really on top of things. Notice the change to the website, already created an account, made a payment today. So. And then once you've created your online account and logged in, this is the account information homepage. It will come up with the service address, the customer name, some basic information, balance due, and whether there's any uh, past due balance on the account. Then using the left side navigation, there's a number of things that you can do and review related to your account. So it's not only transactional based, but it's also information based. Um, one thing, for example, a user can do is go to their billing history. So here it provides three years of billing history uh, with the bill date and the amount so they can see what the past trends have been for their billing activity. Um, you can also look uh, at the payment history, make payments, set up auto pay if you want to do a recurring transaction. You can look at a consumption report if you want to look more at, at consumption-based activity rather than billing activity. 
uh, edit your account, you want to change password or change any information related to your billing address or phone number. Uh, manage e-billing is where you will set up your email notification if you'd like to do that. And also information related to frequently asked questions and contact information if they need to contact the finance department for any assistance. For the email notification, um, once a user has created an online account from the left navigation bar, they'll just select the manage e-billing tab and then they'll have the option to either choose only a paperless email notification or choose both an email notification and receipt of the paper bill. Um, we'll go two billing periods with a paper bill being sent to make sure that the email notification is set up and working correctly. Um, and the email that is received provides only a summary of the water bill and a link to the online water billing application for more information for the resident. In regards to notification to residents, we up, updated the website today. Um, we'll have a press release that will be issued tomorrow and posted on the homepage of the, of the website. Um, there will be a brief article in the February edition of the dialogue, and we're including a notation on the water bills in each of January, February, and March to cover our entire customer base so that they'll know that that application is available. So we're very excited about it. I do want to give special recognition to both Diane Horn and LaRonda Haynes in the finance and IT department who did um, just a mountainous amount of work in setting it up and testing, working with some of our uh, resident employees on testing who actually volunteered to be guinea pigs for us and <laughs> go through the process um, before we went live. So we're very, very excited. Um, and then just put a footnote there that for more information, you can go to the website, select services and water billing. So thank you. Any questions? Elizabeth, before you leave, mm -hmm. would you explain for those uh, who might be watching at home who already are a part of the um, debit program, I think that's what 14% of the customers are already part of the debit program. What do they have to do, if anything? Yeah, we're actually at about 18% of people who have manually established auto pay uh, through ACH. Um, for residents who just want to maintain exactly what they have, they don't need to do a thing. That will continue to work. However, if they do want access either to the historical information related to their account or they would like to switch from auto pay to credit card payments, they can create an online account. Their bank information will automatically populate and then they'll be able to edit their account uh, and make any changes that they would like to make. Questions from the council? I actually have a couple. Randy, did you? No. No? Okay. <clears throat> um, number one, how mobile friendly is this? Um, if I wanted to do this on my iPhone, how would that go? I personally don't know how mobile friendly our website has been. I don't know if Susan Banks can help with that. Um, I will note that. Um, that the American Eagle website has had some conflicts with certain versions of Internet Explorer, and so their recommendation is that you use Google Chrome as your browser. Um, for those who have iPads or certain versions of Internet Explorer that are trying to use, if they run into any trouble, they recommend downloading the free version of Google Chrome. Um, but I don't know as far as mobile application how that would transfer. Thank you. The mobile application is now being redesigned um, to be more friendly. It hasn't really worked through and through since launch. Um, so it is being redesigned and um, we're looking at um, ways to make it obviously more user friendly. Um, but there is always an option on the mobile version to go to the full website so you can get to it that way. So I just the reason I ask is I <clears throat> spend a lot of my time in the world of retailing and um, Two years ago, the big word on the street was e-commerce. Now it's m-commerce, and uh, increasingly, people are doing all their personal shopping and transactions, or as much of it as they can, right from their iPhone or their Samsung or their Droid or whatever it is that they use. And uh, I think that's that that level of convenience is going to be increasingly expected by people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the other question I had was, you mentioned auto pay. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is just my ignorance, do we have um, a facility where people can do level payments for their water? 
Um, we don't have we don't have payment plans, but what people have been able to do is enroll with um, their bank information for automatically deducting their payment from their from their checking account. But if you want to set up a recurring transaction, for instance, that wouldn't you you wouldn't know what your bill was going to be each each cycle. Right. You get a paper bill, and there's a notation on your water bill that says that it's it will automatically de be deducted on the due date and right. the amount of it. But it will okay. vary from quarter to quarter based on your usage. Yes. Okay. So, um, is that something? It's just another question. You know, if you can set it up to just automatically kick out the same amount every month. That might be something that some residents would appreciate. You mean like a ComEd budget plan? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or a gas. Yeah, they can afford to pay more than that. But I think we should be pay as you go. It's just a thought as a as a way to make things a little easier. So, for the for the residents. So, um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. That completes my report for this evening. Okay. Uh, the next items on the agenda are comments by council members. Are there any other than by me, uh, <laughs> which I've already done? So, all right. Um, next item is opportunity for citizens to address the city council on non-agenda items. This is on. This is specifically time to talk about things that are not on our agenda tonight. There will be public comment on other items that are on our agenda for later on. Yes, sir. Paul Hammond, <clears throat> 511 Beverly. I would like to talk about impact fees. First, a little history. I attended 44 consecutive District 115 school board meetings during the four-year planning period for the Lake Forest High School $54 million expansion program. What has changed since then? Copper has increased from $1 a pound to $3 a pound. Copper is used in building wire, motors, and many other components of a building. Just recently, residents in New Trier School District approved $100 million for 25 classrooms or $4 million a classroom. Obviously, a classroom doesn't cost $4 million, but if you have an additional 500 students, then you need to also increase the cafeteria, the library, the bathrooms, offices for the additional teachers, et cetera. In Lake Forest, you have 8,000 homes and 4,000 students, or every two living units produces a student. So every 40 living units or homes on average requires a new classroom. And based on current construction costs of $4 million per classroom, then each new housing unit should have an impact fee of $100,000. The current impact fee for a new housing unit is just under $20,000 for schools. So the Lake Forest residents are losing $80,000 for every new housing unit built in Lake Forest because the impact fees are too low. I enjoyed living in Lake Forest for the past 56 years, and I plan on living here for another 30 years, but I do not want to subsidize new construction. I don't want more congestion in Lake Forest. I don't want more people in Lake Forest Beach on 4th of July. I don't want more banned days for using water. If somebody wants to build new housing units in Lake Forest, then have them pay the true cost for using the city assets. Any new property taxes are used for operating costs and not capital costs. So every new housing unit I see being built in Lake Forest, I see the current residents losing $80,000 per unit because the impact fees are too low based on current construction costs of city assets that those new residents will be using. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any other members of the public that would like to speak to the council on non-agenda items? Okay, uh, the next item, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on our agenda is our omnibus vote uh, consideration. So I'm gonna read each item. This may take a little while, there are quite a few of them, so bear with me. The first item is approval of the December 1st, 2014 City Council meeting minutes. 
The second item is approval of the December 10th, 2014 special city council meeting minutes. The third item is the check register for the period November 22nd through December 19th, 2014. The fourth item is the approval of golf course operating bank account and a resolution establishing authorized signers on the account. <clears throat> the fifth item is ratification of the adoption of ordinances terminating special service areas 15, 33, 34, 35, and 36. The sixth item is consideration of a resolution ratifying the execution of a contract for the purchase of certain real property. Uh, the Seventh item is consideration of ordinances approving recommendations from the Building Review Board. Uh, this is a first reading and if desired by the City Council a final approval. Uh, the eighth item is consideration of ordinances approving recommendations from the Historic Preservation Commission. Also first reading and if desired by the City Council final approval. The ninth item is consideration of recommendations from the Zoning Board of Appeals in support of ordinances granting zoning variances. Again, first reading, and if desired by the City Council, final approval. The tenth item is the approval of a lease agreement between the Eloa Farm Foundation and the Parks and Recreation Department for the Eloa Cottage. And the eleventh and last item is consideration of a request to waive building permit fees for improvements at Gorton Community Center, a city-owned building. <coughs> Do I have any specific questions or comments that uh, any of the council members would like to make on any of these yes this is for Kathy uh, item number eight do I have to recuse myself mm -hmm. item number eight Westminster should I recuse myself on that one probably okay <laughs> didn't think of that So do we pull that one out and vote on it separately so Alderman Edelman can, okay. Uh, why don't we take that first then even though it's out of order? Is that gonna? Mine too. What the leave Biddy, is that gonna? Okay, yeah, you know what? That's, that involves nine, nine as well, as right? Because well. the same property is, is has a, an ordinance on oh. uh, number nine as well. Correct. <clears throat> <clears throat> so let's take number eight and nine separately. And nine and well, it's, I think it's You're right, sure. building re historic res preservation and, build and uh, zoning board, right? You're right. So items eight and nine, uh, and Biddy, are, am I throwing you off? No. Okay. You're fine. Uh, Alderman Edelman has uh, recused himself from those two votes, so uh, I would uh, entertain a motion for first reading and, uh, and if desired, Final approval. Actually, those are two separate motions. My right? suggestion would be that we would, unless there are other questions on the consent agenda or on the omnibus agenda, have a motion to approve the omnibus agenda as presented, with the exception of those two items, and then we'll come back and revisit the two items that have been okay. pulled. <clears throat> so, but there, number seven is also a first reading and, and final approval, if desired. So, do we pull that one out at the same time? Seven, eight, and nine. We're all in that category. Uh, the, the issue is not the first reading. The issue is uh, Alderman Edelman's uh, interest in 111 Westminster, West Westminster. So it's just those two items. It's actually the first item under item eight and the first, uh, the second item under item nine of the omnibus agenda. Those are the two things that are being pulled from the omnibus. And your omnibus vote would be inclusive of the first reading. So we'll make one. It'd be a motion, one motion to approve the omnibus agenda with the first reading approvals for items seven, eight, and nine, with the exception of the two that we're pulling. Have I confused you enough? Okay. Well, I'll entertain such a motion. <laughs> so moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Uh, uh, oh, oh, it's a roll call. Sorry. Okay. Question as far as public participation on the omnibus. Uh, there will Mayor, be, you're, there will you're be. able to entertain his comment. Sure, if you wish. absolutely. Uh, 
have a uh, comment regarding that item six. Paul Hammond, 511 Beverly. It is tough to be a city council member because it's tough to vote against the crowd when you know that the crowd is wrong. When you have a flat tire, you stop driving because there's too much resistance. The current owners of 120 East Laurel are putting a lot of resistance on the city council, so maybe it's not the right thing to buy. If I would perform an infrared scan on your house for heat loss, then I would be putting a different light on the issue regarding heat loss. I'm trying to put a different light on the Laurel Avenue project. Firstly, the 10 acre site is on the city books for $10 million. The tax increment financing costs are 7 million. The impact fee is not being collected for police, fire, library, public works, water plant and parks are over 4 million. The impact fee is not being collected for the schools is 17 million. So you better be selling that 10 acre site for $38 million. Secondly, any future property tax revenue is mainly for salaries and most of the rest is for heat, electricity, insurance, and other non-capital expenditures. So any future property tax revenue is for operating expenses and not capital costs. Finally, my solution for the 10-acre Laurel Avenue site would be if any resident asks you about the site, then you tell them that the property is for sale at $10 million and that patience is golden and that the city is not gonna give away valuable assets. In, in conclusion, the smartest businesses know when to cut their losses as early as possible. I would vote no and cut the city losses before buying this property at 120 East Laurel. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Can I just ask a question about number five? I, I didn't think about it until just now. Um, so this is the... Uh, ordinance uh, terminating the SSAs, just for purposes of clarification, those are terminated effective 2014, correct? So there That's is correct. no- you, you voted on this at your December meeting. Right. The concern that raises this for ratification is that at that time, the agenda was posted to list only two of them to be terminated. Your vote right. was to terminate all five and just to ensure we don't have any hiccup on that, we're having you ratify the action with it on the agenda. But the effective date was for the original ordinance. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. And Thank you. The, it, you're now primed to take a vote on the pending motion, which would address all of the items on the omnibus agenda, except for the two on 11, 111 West Westminster. Okay. I will. I guess entertain another, a new motion? No, no, we just nope. be a We've motion. We've got the motion. The roll call, just get it Okay. Alderman Waldo. Aye. Alderman Beidler. Aye. Alderman Pandelion. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Adelman. Aye. Alderman Moreno. Aye. Six yay, zero nay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and then the next item would be for uh, first reading and final approval. Uh, I, I would suggest that we, on, on 111, on number eight for 111 Westminster, I would suggest that we have a vote specifically on the waiver. I don't think that Alderman Edelman's interest is affected by the procedural vote. Um, and then we can have, if that is granted, a vote on the final approval. Otherwise, we can just have a motion for the first reading. Because you need six for the first. Right, we need we need six to waive first reading, but the procedural vote does not implicate his interest. It's just simply a procedural motor, motion. Okay. If he feels uncomfortable doing so, that's that's fine too, and it can be a first reading and be deferred until your next meeting. You're saying I can vote on eight? You can vote on the procedural waiver. vote to waive first reading. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's not a substantive. Uh, addressing of it, it just allows the matter to go forward. And then what happens with if you get the, the six, final approval? If it's a 6-0 vote, then you will have waived first reading, and then on the substantive vote for final approval, Alderman Edelman will be recusing himself. You will need all five. You, you will have to do this without any nays. Okay. 
Uh, well, then I would entertain a motion to waive first reading on uh, omnibus items eight and nine. That we, we should do those separately. Do separately, okay, on item eight then. With respect to 111 <coughs> West West. So move. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? No. Roll call. It's gonna oh, be a roll, roll call. call. Okay, sorry. Uh, Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Feidler? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. Six yay, zero nay. Motion you're, carries. You're now primed to have a motion to approve <laughs> the item number eight under, or I'm, I'm sorry, yes, item number eight under 111 West Westminster. Okay. Uh, would entertain a motion? So move. We have a second? Second. Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Beidler? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. <coughs> Yay, zero nay, motion carries. And for the record, and there's an abstention. There's a, an abstention by Alderman Adelman. Absolutely. And on now, what about the rest of eight and nine? Don't we, now, do the know, rest we, of them? we already approved those. We already we approved everything perfect. except eight and nine. Yeah. So, so, but now we have to just do just to nine. keep you just to keep <coughs> you on your toes. And this is why we had uh, Alderman so. Pantaleone being acting mayor tonight. <laughs> 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 so no, we, we, we now have we have the, to do the same thing with item nine now. Right, number nine with respect to one eleven West Westminster. We need first a motion to, to waive, waive first, first reading. reading. I'll make a motion to waive for first re reading. Okay. Second. Okay. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Beidler. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Adelman. Aye. Alderman Moreno. Aye. Six yay, zero nay. Motion to waive carries. Okay. I'll now make a motion for final approval. Second. Alderman oh. Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Beidler. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Moreno. Aye. Alderman Adelman. Abstain. Okay. Five yay. We did one it. Abs one abstention. <laughs> motion carries. Thank you. We're, we were getting so the you, hang of it toward the end. Just to do a recap, you've now approved everything that was on the omnibus agenda, albeit two of them were outside of that vote. Right. Okay. Okay. The next item is uh, ordinances. <clears throat> Consideration of a recommendation from the Plan Commission in support of the approval of ordinances pertaining to the establishment of a tax increment financing district on a 10 acre site located on the northwest corner of Laurel and Western Avenues. This is first reading. Thank you, Acting Mayor Pendeleon, members of the Council. I'll just do a quick introduction and then. Uh, the city's TIF consultant, Lee Brown, is, is going to give you a brief presentation. On December 10th, the Plan Commission, at the direction of the City Council, held a public hearing to consider the TIF district. Uh, previous to that, they did have a workshop uh, to get the basics of TIF, so they had a good understanding of the TIF district. <coughs> the Plan Commission, after hearing some public testimony and after some deliberation, recommended approval of the TIF, TIF district to the City Council. The Plan Commission did acknowledge that they are not um, privy to the financial details and the financial aspects of the TIF are not under their purview, but from a land use perspective, they do believe that this is the appropriate tool to support redevelopment of this site. Um, with that, I'll introduce Lee Brown. Good evening. You have the opportunity of seeing the three ordinances. Uh, they are the statutory required ordinance if we are to adopt the tax increment district. Three ordinance, first, that of adopting tax increment allocation financing as the tool. Second, an ordinance adopting redevelopment plan and project, that is the accompanying document that is the plan and what you are going to do to seek the redevelopment of the area. And the third being the adoption of the boundaries of the tax increment district. Very briefly, tax increment financing is an economic development technique that allocates future property taxes from a designated area to pay for project improvements within that area. The program can last up to 23 years. A couple of items that I'd hope that we can emphasize. First, tax increment financing is not a tax. Tax increment financing does not freeze 
the taxes paid on the property. It is a tool used by the municipality to leverage private investment, to encourage private property owners to invest in their site. And unlike other economic development tools, the tax rates are the same whether inside or outside of the TIF district. So the point being, a property owner that has an equivalent valued property inside the district pays the identical taxes that they would outside the TIF, the TIF district. The, the critical difference is where those tax dollars are collected and used. So within a tax increment district, it is used to encourage the private investment by making public investments in the property. A little dim, but uh, the city has a history of using tax increment. Uh, in 1988, we established a tax increment district in the West Lake Forest area. And the graph that you're seeing here tracks the increases in property value over the life of that district, which is now closed. So in the beginning, about three, uh, just over $3 million of property value was assessed within that West Lake Forest TIF district. And that red line was the projected increases in value that we thought would occur at the time. These bars represent the actuality of a much higher increase in the property values. At its very peak, over $60 million of EAV, assessed equalized value, was available for the tax increment district to uh, pay for public improvements within that area. The district bounded on the north by Franklin and all the way on the northern edge of that property, uh, of that right of way, on the east by Western Avenue and its east right of way line, on the south by the southern right of way line of Laurel, and on the west by the line that divides the city owned property that was the former municipal services facility and the single family homes to the west of that line. So an area of 10.6 acres, inclusive of 13 parcels, seven structures, one of which, excuse me, two structures, but uh, one property of which, which is currently privately held, the remainder owned by the city. The anticipated outcomes for the tax increment district is the construction and occupancy of a residential or predominantly residential redevelopment of the, of the site. The existing tax base assessable EAV of $96,000 is anticipated to grow over the life of the TIF district to approximately $30.5 million of equalized assessed value. And the growth of the annual property taxes that are generated on the site from annually just under $5,000 to $1.5 million on an annual basis. I'll take your questions. Questions from the council? I don't understand why the streets are included to their far, far edge as part of the district as opposed to the inside edge of the streets. Well, the streets themselves won't generate value. Right. But we can spend money um, generated by the TIF district within the boundaries of the district. So if there are public improvements in those streets and they are anticipated, we can include the entire area, all the improvements within the right of way. And it is our right to define the district? Absolutely, your right to define it. Uh, the guidance is that you generate a district that's large enough to collect the incremental value, an area that you will be spending public improvement dollars on, but not so large that you uh, include property that doesn't need to be in the district. Thank you. Other questions from the council? Okay, uh, I would uh, offer an opportunity for the public to comment on this proposal. Paul Heyman, 511 Beverly. I listened to the December 10th 
2014 plan commission deliberation four times. My takeaway was that even though the tax increment financing budget was shown, the one important missing number not given the plan commission was the estimate on or proposed sale price of the 10 acres. So the plan commission did approve the TIF vehicle, but without knowing the estimated sale price, the plan commission was flying blind. As I stated earlier, the 10 acre site is on the city books now for 11 million because of that piece of land that they purchased tonight. The tax increment financing costs are gonna be 7 million. The impact fee is not being collected for police, fire, library, public works, water plant, and parks are over 4 million. The impact fee is not being collected for the schools is 17 million. So you better be selling the 10 acre lot for $39 million. In conclusion, if I were you, then I would send this issue back to the plan commission with the city council's estimate on the sale price and then see what they would say about the TIF of the Laurel Avenue project. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Other members of the public? Mr. Um, Acting Mayor Pandeleone, maybe it would be appropriate since the comment has been raised about what the schools are not getting is to have Lee talk about under the TIF laws what the schools will be getting because I think uh, we've met with representative school district 67 and 115 and I think under Illinois law the compensation that's built into the law is rather um, is certainly fair uh, for the schools but if you could go through that in detail because I don't want the public at home to think the schools are being left out in the cold. Well first let me indicate that the uh, incremental values the incremental uh, revenues that are collected are on property taxes that are independent of, of whatever uh, impact fees the city does or does not have uh, what is collected uh, allows for and requires essentially as mr kyle has indicated the statute requires that if there are school children that are, that are generated or if there are additional users of the library system the tiff district is required to pay a uh, compensation, if you will, for the increase in costs. And it's calculated on the basis of uh, the current of any given year, the current uh, per student cost or per user cost, and the incremental change is compensated up to 40% of the total revenue stream that is incremental revenue, which is a quite considerable amount for each student, uh, which is available if requested by the school district it must be done on an annual basis and it's on the basis of actual school children that would would be generated in the uh, within the tip district and or actual users of the library generated within that district so as a follow-up and we've just had some preliminary conversations with representatives of the school district about this is annually they would formally present to us here are how many students uh, are coming out of this development this would be brought to the city council on your agenda. You would then be making a motion to approve a, um, uh, an allocation of TIF dollars back to the school district pursuant to the Illinois law. So that will be done on an annual basis and we'll have a better way of tracking actually how many students are coming out to it, what the cost is to the taxpayers of Lake Forest. Other questions? I have one. Um, when I think about a TIF, I see it as a means of managing cash flows over time for the benefit of a district. Is that fair? Yes. It is a, a way of making sure that the public improvements that are necessary to encourage development can be paid for by the development itself. It's a circular process in which the developer is paying their fair share of taxes like they would on any other site in the city. And those revenues are collected to be able to compensate the public improvements that you're going to ultimately uh, authorize. This 
document these ordinances do not authorize specific uh, public improvements to be made. You will be making individual decisions in the years to come. And the management, if you will, of the revenue stream allows you to make good decisions with the knowledge of what is available in terms of the revenue stream uh, at the time that you need to make those decisions. So from the city's perspective, the management of those cash flows carries risk for any entity that establishes a TIF. What are, generally speaking, for the benefit of, of ourselves here in, on council, but also the public, what are generally the, the risks involved in those timing decisions? What, what do you generally, uh, uh, what have you seen in case studies of TIFs? Well, I think you can use your own uh, existing or pre-existing TIF as an example of one of two types of TIF that are common within the state. First is when you really don't have a strong concept or idea about what the development will be and you're using the public improvements to encourage uh, development. You, you have greater um, risk in not knowing the scale or the timing of development in that kind of that's why you saw a considerably increase uh, over our conservative estimates that we first made. The other type is really what's before you now, which is a, uh, a relatively well-defined site, a well-defined uh, project that is likely to uh, be approved as you go through the process of developing an approval for the, uh, the, the developer that has been selected. You'll have uh, much stronger control through that of what will be built and the estimates of value at the time. Now, we've already seen estimates of value of, a, of what would be built, and we have used those in part to help define the size and scale of this project. So in the first TIF, the West Lake Forest TIF, uh, there were much higher risks to the knowledge about how much revenue the city would see. In this one, we have a much better definition of the scale of what is likely to occur on the site and the risks are much lower. And the reason for that is the nature of the use of the properties in the West Lake Forest TIF? It was a much larger area okay. with many different properties owned by many different uh, potential developers. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question too uh, and I, I, I don't, I can't find my note about this on the page, but you'll you'll remember. Um, and this was about uh, the possibility of our the, uh, in in the in the materials we read. You talked about the likelihood that there would often be cash for the, the, there would be cash transactions, but not always. That wouldn't always be possible, and that we would issue some obligations. I couldn't tell how many, and I guess we aren't necessarily limited. But I wonder if we have a general sense of number on how that. Is that once? Is that more than once? I may turn to Elizabeth for details, but it's, it's understood that Elizabeth there are question. basically two kinds of things. One is a sort of early on public improvements, the first of which is cleanup of the site. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have which a, we've, I think we've already start, authorized have an environmental that. condition that has to be cleaned up in, in order to make the site developable. So those early um, project costs are likely to be uh, an initial borrowing. Okay. Later project costs related to keeping the, the site um, ready and uh, to compensate for the improvements that are going to be made both by the public and the private, that is likely to occur at a later time. Right. So the, we'll be doing this more than once. Okay. Much of that is based on uh, good calculations of, of what the investment uh, market is like. How, how many uh, How many of those were issued for the West Lake Forest project? Two. Two? Two. Okay. All right. No, I was interested because it didn't seem to suggest that there was a limitation. I just wondered if we had a sense of what we were. The limitation is on uh, generally the revenue stream that will be available. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other comments, questions? I actually have a couple of questions. The um, going back to the dollars <clears throat> again, run running from current tax revenues from this ten-acre site of approximately five thousand dollars per year. 
to the estimate we're using is about a million and a half. Um, that is that is revenue in perpetuity, as opposed to a one-time payment of say an impact fee or something like that. Uh, and what rough, roughly what percentage of our uh, tax bills, property tax bills, go to the schools? Fifty. About fifty percent. 25 to 67, 25 to 115. <clears throat> so from this, so reasonable sort of projection would be that once completed, and we're not talking about 23 years here probably, it's more likely to be four or five years, uh, if that long. Uh, this, the revenue stream to the schools annually in perpetuity, barring a collapse in property values, uh, is on the order of $750,000 a year. Split between the two of them. Split between the two. Mm -hmm. And then the library would also. Yeah, yeah after, the, after, after the, the 23. Though. Yeah, during the life of the district, and that's really um, not known to be um, 23 years or shorter. Um, during that period of time, we collect the same amount, the $1.5 million, and it goes into the TIF fund. And it's available for, for uh, reducing debt mm -hmm. of, the, of the fund itself. Beyond that, when the district is closed, and, and the parallel is that you went the full 23 years in the Westlake Forest TIP district. At that point, it's distributed on the basis of the tax rates that exist during that on an annual basis from that point forward. Right. We're reasonably conservative in the estimates here. We're using uh, appreciation rates of less than a percent on an annual basis. That's a very, very conservative estimate. To, you might choose to think that values in the community will be much higher than that. I would hope so. Certainly be good for everybody who owns property in town. But I think that, that the point I'm trying to make is that this becomes a permanent source of revenue for the affected taxing bodies as opposed to a one-time payment of an impact right. fee or, or something like that. So it, much, much greater value from the <coughs> long-term viability of, the, of these districts. Um, if there are other questions, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion. This, this is first reading? This is first reading. First reading on all three ordinances. So moved. Second. All the red. Biddy? Alderman Waldeck? Aye. Alderman Beidler? Aye. Alderman Pandeleon? Aye. Alderman Tack? Aye. Alderman Edelman? Aye. Alderman Moreno? Aye. Six yeas or nay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is approval of an ordinance that allows for the revising, amending, restating, codifying, and compiling of existing ordinances. This is also a first reading. Uh, Mr. Filippini, if you could. Thank you, Acting Mayor, members of the council. Um, this is a somewhat long-standing project for the city uh, that goes back, I guess, uh, over 40 years. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the city lasted a wholesale recodification in 1971. The ordinances uh, have been maintained uh, in the city code, but over the years there have been uh, a few hiccups and some blips and things of that nature that have uh, caused the code to be not fully up to date and not uh, as easily uh, functioning in the electronic environment that most people operate today. So um, uh, the, the council did um, enter into a contract with American Eagle, uh, I believe it was about 18 months ago, um, for purposes of undertaking a recodification and uh, in the course of that, also uh, doing some reorganization of the code to make sure that it was a little more user friendly than it had been in its prior format. Uh, the ordinance before you tonight for first reading is to replace our existing 1971 code with the updated 2015 code. Um, and uh, the effort here is not to change anything in a substantive way, but rather to update it in a format and make sure things are consistent. And that was an effort that both the codifiers as well as staff went through uh, considerable effort to try to make sure we're correct. I should note that in the course of that, um, 
a lot of ideas have come, uh, have, have bubbled up to the surface, and those are things that are likely to be brought to the council over time in the months to come. But uh, for purposes of bringing this to you now, uh, the recommendation is to try to bring it to you in largely an, uh, an intact version of what we have with the uh, reorganization and, and updating and, uh, frankly, filling up some of the holes that had been uh, occurring with some of the gaps in, in codifying uh, ordinances as they, ha as they have happened. A um, couple things about the ordinance. What it will do will be to replace the old. Uh, we do have in the ordinance a savings clause um, because with an undertaking of this size, stuff happens, and to avoid un th things happening unintendedly, uh, we have this provision that will allow the council to make sure that if something got inadvertently dropped, that it can be reinserted as if it had never been absent from the code. Um, so with that, uh, we are presenting this to you. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had the, the joy of reading the updated code. Um, figure war and peace three times over and about half is interesting. Uh, maybe a third is interesting. And uh, in fact, if you're not a municipal lawyer, maybe about a hundredth is interesting. Uh, <laughs> but we are asking uh, for your consideration for first reading tonight, and then we'll be presenting this for final reading at the next meeting. Any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. Was there a cost involved in this? There, there was a significant cost involved in this. When the council approved Can you this. Someone refresh my memory? Uh, do you remember? Uh, I want to say $30,000, I think, to do the codification work. Does that sound? <laughs> That's with American Eagle? Legal. American Legal. Oh. Yeah. They do a lot of codification work for other municipalities. And we went through a bidding process and identified them. Uh, I think they did a, a very good job. I think um, they will come back and say that they uh, lost money on the deal because uh, there was a lot of work involved. And as you might imagine, with 40 years of not going through the codification process, there was a lot of changes. Uh, and as Vic said, it was actually a very um, um, worthwhile and productive process for the staff to go through, although I don't think the staff will agree with that necessarily. But I think we identified sections of the code that quite frankly didn't make sense or didn't reflect current practices in the city. And those are what Vic mentioned that we will be bringing back to you. And uh, I think we'll come back to you with trying to divide the work uh, between the nine aldermen or the eight aldermen and the mayor so that each of you don't get stuck with doing the whole uh, revisions uh, that the staff is going to have to bring forward and meet. Each of you will hopefully have a section that you'll be responsible for because it could be, you know, a couple hundred pages uh, each uh, as we go forward. So uh, we'll try and make it manageable. And in most cases, this isn't doing really any wholesale changes. It's just trying to update the code so it's reflective of current practices and policies and procedures of the city council. And, and will the online version be hyperlinked from one section to the next? Yes. Yeah, it should be. It's not now, is it? it? No, it should be very user friendly. Good. Bob, is there a, a, a sorry. Go, go is ahead. There a t is there a time period that we would need to look at this again? I mean, it strikes me that maybe 40 years was a little too long to wait. We, we, do you normally look at this thing every uh, every 10 or to make sure that it, it? Well, actually, the good news is that after we get to this point, then we have a um, uh, an agreement with them that there will be annual updates. Oh. And so our code will oh. forever be up to date and we'll never get into the same okay. uh, predicament that it was. And so you'll, you, you want us, are we going to do second reading of this at the next meeting? Are we going to yes. do these 200 pages before then? No. Uh, we'll get the second reading done so we can get... that time yeah. out. I'm, I'm not a fast reader. Right what now. were you doing this weekend? I'm glad weekend. to do my job. I just want to be sure. 100 pages is what we had for tonight. Yeah, right. I realize that, and I know yeah. how long it took me, so I'm, you know, no, but what we want I needed some second readings myself on that. <laughs> well, the good news is, too, is that they will be redline versions, and so you can go through them pretty quickly and see okay. the changes, because a lot of it is just verbiage, um, you know, changing titles, uh, those kinds of things. Okay. But... Um, I think we'll get second reading at your January 20th meeting. We will uh, come back to you at that meeting and maybe have a plan, an action plan, as to how we could divide that up in this various sections and who will do what uh, or who will agree to do what. And uh, then we'll come back whenever is uh, permissible uh, based on timing. Okay. And, Thank you. And just to put a sharper point on that, the action on second reading would be to actually adopt 
this new code, the things that will follow, the 200 pages per, uh, per council member, is with respect to some of the updates that were uh, identified for recommendation to the council as part of the review. And, and just to help me understand uh, what you went through, uh, could you summarize the process of uh, codification? Sure. The, uh, the, the city first did a massive document dump on the codifier so that they had all of the ordinances as well as our existing code. They went through the effort of making sure that the ordinances as they were adopted and changing things were uh, reflected in the code, and they found in many instances things were not. Uh, the online code uh, had become woefully uh, out of date. And, and so what their task was was to try to bring those up to date and, you know, move in and, move in and out certain things. They also, because they do this a lot, um, offered suggestions on reorganization based on what other communities had reflected as being an effective way to make them more accessible to the uh, to the users, and they then took what we had and reformatted uh, them so that they would reflect more that more traditional manner to to access a code. They then gave that draft back to the city, and the city staff through departments and through broader eyes, uh, you know, broader review uh, of the various eyes within the city staff, went through and actually uh, identified those. As part of that, the codifier had raised a series, I believe it was about a 30-page memo of specific questions, and those were things that, that staff in our office looked at for purposes of trying to make sure that everything was addressed in as appropriate way as possible, and then another revision was made which uh, was basically checked to make sure that things got caught, and that is what's being presented to you tonight. Uh, but again, there was a specific determination to segregate those issues that reflected policy changes from those which were more in the nature of Scrivener's errors, clarifications, oddities, and, and the like. So that's why this is being presented in really two different bites to you. The first one is to just give you uh, sort of the Earl Shy version of your old car. And uh, the, the second go around will be with some better updates. Than that. It's a little better than that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no ups, no extra. <laughs> Try, trying not to give you any ups or extras in terms of policy issues. The next round will be some of the upgrades on the code that uh, staff thinks would be appropriate to make sure that the code language is fully reflective of what is more common staff practice and, and good practice. Thank you. You're too young to know who Earl Scheib was. That's number <laughs> one. Uh, secondly, <laughs> if there's an annual update, it begs the question, how much is that costing us a year? Two th what, it, there's what? A, it's actually going to be supplemented twice a year, okay. oh. uh, once in February and once in October. So what's And what's cost? that cost on an annual basis? Uh, it's based on pa number of pages, dual columns, uh, two-sided page, um, each page that's a physical page that's actually added to the book is $21 per page. So let's use small font. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, a couple, who, who in the city staff spearheaded this in terms of actually getting this done? Uh, Biddy uh, did. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she had to... Um, uh, suffer the wrath of each of the department heads who got their respective <laughs> sections and said what uh, and uh, kept bird dogging them to make sure that they would review it and get back to them and uh, so she was the one that uh, uh, did the uh, entire work of uh, helping to select the firm and uh, keeping them on track and it's been a huge undertaking and uh, we're really pleased with uh, where we're at despite the depiction of Earl Scheib <laughs> and I actually think that both Biddy and Karina are going to be framing the shortest straws that they drew. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you for that. This is, a, I mean, when I just ponder this in my mind, it's just overwhelming to think about. And uh, so thank you for, for uh, keeping it going and getting it to the finish line. Um, you mentioned semi-annual updates. 
once this is all digitized, wouldn't it be updated on on the fly and then maybe just checked over once a year or twice a year as opposed to waiting to accumulate all the changes? Yeah, typically, and it's more a matter of managing cost, um, you do it semi-annual and then you'll find that there's going to be a tab on the on the electronic version that will say recently adopted ordinances mm -hmm. so that you'll have the code and if you're interested to see if anything's been modified since then the, the tab will draw you to those <coughs> and they'll be imported into the main document twice a year okay and, and that's you can do it more frequently it's just that there's a greater cost to that right okay i just uh, had this vision of you know papers piling up as we do things here and at the end of six months having another sort of mini version of the uh, the project that you just completed which might be a little well, but it sounds like the, the, there's a process for there is a there. process and I think also once we get this behind us keep in mind that even if looking at tonight's agenda most of the stuff doesn't go in the code I mean you're passing ordinances or adopting ordinances but that isn't changing the code this would be specific to those ordinances that are amending the city code okay thank you any other comments I, I will say that I stand by my roll side no, no <laughs> <extra>. <laughs> uh, are there any uh, members of the public that would like to comment on this ordinance uh, there being none I would entertain a motion so moved approved First reading. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please, Katie. Alderman Waldeck. Aye. Alderman Beidler. Aye. Alderman Pandeleon. Aye. Alderman Tack. Aye. Alderman Edelman. Aye. Alderman Moreno. Aye. <coughs> Six yay, zero nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is new business. Alderman Edelman. It's not really new business. It's just kind of related to ordinances, and that has to do with the construction codes. How are we doing? I thought we were going to get rid of cast iron waste pipe and transition to PVC. The construction codes is actually meeting tomorrow, and we were kind of waiting for this reconification because some of the work they have done uh, is done with the old chapter and section number. So now that we have the new code, I expect in February we'll be bringing some of that forward to you. Great. Um, uh, it'll. The construction codes uh, it will recommend a change with respect to cast iron pipe. They'll also be recommending uh, some changes, uh, enhancements likely to life safety aspects of construction as well. Like the what? Like adding more cost? Like life safety aspects and uh, energy construction. But you should be start to see those in February. So after you update this new code, we'll begin changing it right away. Okay, thanks. Any other uh, items of new business? Uh, any additional items for council discussion? I guess this or these two categories sort of blend into one another. Uh, there being none, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anybody want to stay longer? Okay. <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, George.